So we left off in our last video talking about a particular category of uh, market structure, which is perfect competition. And if you're a firm in a perfectly competitive market, that market has some, <clears throat> some characteristics. And what, what are some of those characteristics? Well, one of them is there are many, many firms in this uh, industry. And each firm which is very small in terms of market share, produces an identical good. Sometimes the book calls it a homogenous product, identical products. So there's no differentiation. And it's easy to go into this industry and it's easy to leave. Another um, characteristic that the book doesn't mention is um, perfect information. In other words, there are no secrets in this industry. If you have some sort of uh, secret way of producing a product at a lower cost, you can't keep that secret. So those ideas will be spread throughout the uh, industry and you can't develop any sort of competitive advantage. Now, you can see there's really no real life industries that fit this textbook definition of uh, perfect competition. But if I draw that uh, market structure spectrum, perfect competition here, monopoly over here. I'm telling you that no real life there are no real life industries that are falling here, but some may fall close to it. For example, some may be right here. So there are industries that are very competitive that have some characteristics of perfect competition, but nothing nothing meets the textbook definition. Now, when you have a firm in a highly competitive market, in this case, a perfectly competitive market, we have a term for them. We call them price takers. And a price taker is basically a firm that has no ability to alter the market price of the good. They must accept the good as the, the market price as given. Um, and the output of a perfectly competitive firm is relatively small. So if a perfectly competitive firm, let's say, doubles their output, it has no impact on price. For example, let's say a, uh, a farmer who has a small plot of land, he grows, let's say, wheat. And uh, he only has one acre of land, let's say. Uh, he harvests his crop, puts it on the back of his donkey, and takes it to market. Well, he could sell all of his crop at the market price. Now, let's say he, he works really hard and he manages to get an extra two bushels out of his small plot of land. So instead of one bushel of, of uh, wheat bring, he brings to market, he brings three bushels of wheat. But can you see how three bushels of wheat in a very large market where they sell millions of bushels, can you see how this one farmer has no ability to supply so much where it affects the pr market price of the good. So therefore, if he brings one bushel, he sells it at the market price. If he brings three bushels, he sells it at the market price. That's why we call this person a price taker. Now, because of this nature, the fact that the, that, that, uh, the firm, like the farmer I mentioned before, is so small in terms of market share and everything is so competitive and they produce an identical good, they have a unique, sh new, uniquely shaped demand curve. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to distinguish between the demand curve for the firm and the demand curve for the market. So let's take a look at that. The market demand curve for the entire industry is a normal looking demand curve. It's, it's got a downward slope. And, but the demand curve for the uh, firm itself, that demand curve is flat. Do you remember our talk when we talked about elasticity? When a, uh, a firm's demand curve became flatter, in other words, it went for, kind of shifted this way, Get rid of that. that means they're more sensitive to a change in price. So the flatter the demand curve, 
the more the more elastic price elastic the goodness and of course the ultimate in terms of flatness is if it's horizontal and that's what the demand curve looks like for a perfectly competitive firm let's show it over here so on the left is the market demand which is downward sloping market supply which is upward sloping but you can see here let me erase these the market demand curve establishes a market supply curve establishes a price and the price will establish the price for the firm and that will show you the perfect the horizontal demand curve for the firm so if this firm raises price just a little bit they sell nothing now of course if they lower price a little bit they'll sell a lot but what we're going to discover is in such a highly competitive industry if you lower price just a little bit um, price has been driven down to minimum average total cost. So if you try to lower price, you're simply going to be taking a loss in every single unit that you sell. So you have no choice but to charge the market price. And that's why we call uh, firms in a perfectly competitive industry a price taker. Now, that leads us to um, the question. If you want to maximize profit and you're in a perfectly competitive industry, how much do you produce to maximize profit? So in that, when, you, when it boils down to, the one thing that, the perfect, that any firm has complete control over is the decision of how much to produce. So the production decision is simply the selection of the short run rate of output. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to maximize profit. <clears throat> so if we're going to look at profit, we got to look at our revenues and costs because remember profit equals total revenue minus total cost so in searching for the most desirable rate of output you want to uh, select that rate of output that gives you the uh, highest revenue and the lowest cost so total revenue this part right here total revenue is the price that you charge multiplied by the output that you sold produced. So we usually say P times Q. And since the perfectly competitive firm sells um, every unit that they produce at the market price, remember the price takers, you can see that revenue moves in a very predictable pattern. Every time you sell one more unit, the, the revenue goes up by the price in which you sold it. And so graphically, it's going to look like this. Um, we, if you sell one unit at $8, we start at zero, right, right here, and we sell one unit at $8, and we move to this point right here. Then we sell another unit, another unit, for eight dollars it moves up by eight so you can see how we're going over one up eight over one up eight over one up eight and that is the slope of this line so if i erase this the slope of this line is eight and, and that's why it goes up in such a predictable pattern. Now, costs are a different matter. They don't move as, an, as, an, as a predictable way. Uh, you know, with, when costs, total cost equals fixed cost plus variable cost, right? Some costs change with output. Some costs do not. And in the short run, some factors cannot be changed given our time frame. So that, that means though some costs are going to be fixed. So let's take a look at that. That's so we got variable costs, we're talking about that. Total cost. So you can see here 
at an output rate of zero, we have total cost right here, which is total cost equals uh, that. total cost equals fixed cost when when Q equals zero, right? Because when you're not producing anything, you have no variable cost. If you have no variable cost, that means your total cost must be equal to your fixed cost. And that's what you see right here. Now, as you start producing, you start to generate variable costs. And you can see how things start to change. Now, the shape of the total cost curve reflects the increasing marginal costs. And the reason why marginal costs are going up is because of the law of diminishing re returns, which means as you produce more, adding a variable input, holding other inputs constant, the, the, the input that you're adding is going to drop in productivity. This is what we call talked about in uh, chapter one. And as a result, your unit labor, your, your, your unit variable costs start to increase. So, primary objective of the producer is to uh, find the output that maximizes profit. And so, what we're going to see here is you got your total revenue curve and your total cost curve. You could see here as you increase output, your revenues are increasing like this and your costs are increasing like this. So if you produce this amount, Q1, your revenues are going to be here. Here. And your total cost is going to be here. So this is a loss right here if you produce this amount. But if you keep increasing your rate of output, your revenues are growing. Your, law, your costs are increasing, but at a slower rate. And you can see at this point, this Q right here, Q2, your revenues equal your costs. So think of it as kind of like a, a break even. Any output greater than this is going to have your revenues greater than your costs. So any output between F and G is some degree of output. So here we've got losses, here we've got profit. So the question is, what rate of output do we produce between F and G? Well, you want to produce that rate of output that gives you the biggest distance between the total revenue line and the total cost line. So we're going to try to figure out how to determine an output rate of H, and we're going to do that in our next video.